food. It is essential to us all. We buy and we consume. We try to eat healthily at best if we have the luxury to choose. But there's a story behind the product that ends up on our plate, a hidden truth. Meet Mamie Prince. She is not a politician. She is not an activist. She is a businesswoman. A woman who gradually developed an insight based on information that came to her during meetings with entrepreneurs and professionals in the fresh food industry all over the world. This input became a vision on how we design our cities and why cities should produce their own food. This is her story. Mijn wereld en mijn reizen en mijn bezoeken bij klanten en de gesprekken die je hebt en de worstelingen die je ziet en de problemen waar mensen tegenaan lopen en weten dat je daar al gewoon oplossingen voor hebt, dat was wel echt een stukje frustratie wat omgezet werd in enorme gedrevenheid, omdat je weet dat het er is. Dus het perspectief wat we hebben uh, om ongelooflijke grote milieuproblemen wel op te kunnen lossen. Uh, that is her. The global infrastructure of how we grow, distribute and consume food today has a huge impact on our environment and our health. Long ago, we grew food close to our homes. Today, food travels thousands of miles, crosses borders. It is grown far away from our homes, in other countries, on a dazzling scale. We pushed our farmers away to build houses, shopping malls, hospitals, highways, schools. Our cities become larger and larger. But where did our food go? According to the UN, every day over 400,000 people move from the countryside to the city. Over 400,000, every single day. Megacities are pushing our farmland away. Our food comes from increasingly greater distances. It travels around the globe by plane, ship, or truck before being consumed. We take it for granted. We even consider the process irreversible. Maney tries to find the connection between the way we produce our food today and the problems we're facing. Like climate change, pollution, food and water waste, lack of healthy food, hunger and obesity. How can we make a difference? According to Maney, changing the way we design our cities and our food production can play a big role in solving many of these problems a vision she now shares around the globe. Het probleem is al groot genoeg. Dus laten we nou proberen om dat probleem wat dichter bij de mensen te brengen. En wat staat er nou dichter bij de mensen dan gewoon voedsel? Dus je dagelijks eten wat je hebt. En hoe mooi zou het zijn als we dat ook weer dicht bij diezelfde mensen brengen? En dat kan vanuit de verantwoordelijkheid van die stad vandaan. Dus in plaats van dat de stad constant eigenlijk die green belt wegduwt, dus daar waar voedsel werd geproduceerd voor de stad. Uh, druk diezelfde stad dat maar weg met haar groei. Het zou geweldig zijn als diezelfde stad begint na te denken over hoe kunnen we dat nou integraal opnemen in grootstedelijke ontwikkelingen. En daarmee breng je de voedselproductie terug in de stad. En dat hoeft helemaal niet zo heel kleinschalig te zijn. Dat kan ook best honderden hectares zijn, want die metropolen zijn ook serieus groot. A strong view. Many is convinced of the advantages. She called this vision the Sustainable Urban Delta. But how did she develop this approach? Mani explains that it happened over the past years during her visits to customers abroad. Mijn visie over deze Sustainable Urban Delta is eigenlijk ontstaan door al mijn reizen en en het aanvliegen op die enorme grote steden 
heeft zo'n enorme impact gemaakt op mijn beleving van wat is nou een metropool en hoe groot is dat eigenlijk? Het, het gevoel dat je een uur lang over alleen maar gebouwde omgeving vliegt. Dat, dat je er voor je gevoel geen eind aankomt. Die alleen maar die lichtjes ziet van al die woningen en die gebouwen zo dicht bij elkaar. En wat de enorme uitdagingen zijn van die grote steden om dat allemaal maar te faciliteren. Hoe organiseer je dit? Dat is enorm. En dat die uitdagingen groot zijn, dat zie je dus ook in al die steden. Dus tijdens mijn bezoeken bij, bij klanten of als je door die steden heen beweegt... En, uh, en ik ben bij mijn collega's die op internationale kantoren zitten... dan, dan ervaar je zo'n stad. En je ervaart wat het is om ongelooflijk veel smok in te ademen... vanwege alle vervuiling. En je weet wat het is als je een hotelkamer inkomt en het stinkt daar naar het riool. Maar hoe moeten die mensen dat allemaal ervaren? En op het moment dat je boven al die steden vliegt... op een gegeven moment ging ik op zoek naar de stukken groen om die grootstedelijke gebieden heen. Van, van waar, zijn, waar is het omland gebleven? En, en, en je gaat het ook echt zien. Wondering where the green farmland had gone, Maney started to study satellite images of cities. She collected data about green belts. Her conclusion was, they are diminishing at an increasing rate. Try to comprehend these NASA pictures. Shanghai, the way it has expanded over the last 20 years, engulfing the farmland around it, with large areas becoming concrete. Then, Maney changed her focus. Of je ziet Nederland. En dat was voor mij een eye-opener. Want aanvliegen op Nederland betekent dat je ook een stad ziet. En dat het de stad is met een aaneengesloten grootstedelijk gebied aan de westkust van Nederland. En wat je daar ziet is dat landbouw en tuinbouw een hele bijzondere plaats innemen in dat landschap van al die steden die naar elkaar toe groeien. En dat heeft zijn waarde gekregen in al die jaren. En die waarde is zo bijzonder dat we dat als we nemen dat zo aan als zoiets gewoons. Maar het is eigenlijk een stad die in staat is om zoveel voedsel te produceren dat het meer produceert dan dat het zelf nodig heeft. Seeing her own country from above made Maney realize that megacities might be able to help solve their own problems and global climate change by embracing food production instead of pushing the farmland away. She realized that food can be a powerful tool. She shares her findings with audiences around the world. Maney is a guest speaker at the majestic New South Wales Parliament building in Sydney, Australia. Her audience is a combination of investors, business leaders and politicians. Her speech takes off by summing up the latest technological innovations in food production. But then there is a twist in the plot. Maney starts emphasizing the consequences of our food production on climate change, pollution, food and water waste, lack of healthy food, hunger, and obesity. This is not what her audience expected. Sydney, Washington, Rotterdam, Ho Chi Minh City. Wherever Maney goes, she asks her audience, what can we do to counter these compelling issues? So what's the plan? What is the plan? Many of our environmental problems are caused by the way we do food production today. Then she sums up the solutions of the sustainable urban delta. Food produced differently, close to where people live, integrated within rapidly growing cities. By 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in cities. And all those people need clean air and they need safety. 
and clean water, of course, and also sufficient food. The unprecedented growth of our metropolises might be a threat at first sight, but can also be seen as a window of opportunity. It will be the century of the cities. The cities are becoming the policy makers of the future. Cities can solve many of our environmental problems. Food production is pushed further and further away from the consumer. But it's not only due to the growing city. Many farmers are no longer able to survive in the countryside around the city and move to urban areas themselves for a better life. The green belts die verdwijnen. Het houdt op te bestaan. Waarom? Die steden rukken op en die steden drukken die green belts weg. De boeren die tot nu toe nog uh, actief waren in die green belts, die zien geen toekomst meer. Die hebben geen perspectief meer. Dus, dus dat verdwijnt. Die boer, de meeste boeren die nu in die green belts nog actief zijn, of je het nou over Sao Paulo hebt of je hebt het over Beijing. Of... Maar kijk eens naar de leeftijd van die mensen. Ik bedoel, ze zijn 65 jaar, 70 jaar, zoals in Japan. Dus het verdwijnt, het houdt op. En dan heb je nog een veel grotere impact daarbovenop. En dat zijn die enorme klimaatveranderingen. De onderschat, maar, maar de klimaatimpact op de manier waarop we voedsel produceren vandaag... wat allemaal steeds grootschaliger moet en steeds meer centraal is in bepaalde gebieden... die ineens geconfronteerd worden met serieuze klimaatveranderingen... dat raakt jou en mij. Mensen zien dat niet. Maney takes us to Henry Gordon Smith in New York. An agricultural planner, Gordon Smith encourages cities to integrate food production in their planning. We used to have our house and our farm, or at least our city and our farm around it. Um, as cities developed, we were able to optimize, let's say, the exporting um, of those resources and, and the needs of our city. Right To say we can centralize that in another place and import it cheaply with hydrocarbons and petrofuels. So that system developed for many, many decades. And that's done a good job in the sense that it really has reduced poverty globally, it's reduced hunger, it's not a, an extremely 100% negative thing. But there's been these externalities, the carbon footprint, the pesticide use, the disconnection from our food, which allows us not to understand what we're consuming and, and how those decisions drive sustainability or our impact on the world. And so I think that it's ironic and also kind of beautiful that we're trying to return to where we were and restore the original idea of cities, which is you don't build a city without the resources needed to feed the city. Because we have been building cities without resources to feed their inhabitants, food needs to come from far away and travels all over the world. Our nutritious and tasty food is modified to be able to travel these long distances, says indoor farmer and investor Mike Zelkind. You can't bring food 2,000 miles in a truck, offload it in some distribution center, have it sit in the sun or in the cold, go through all those temperature zones, have it move through all the distribution centers in this complex supply chain that we have built with 14 different hands touching the food and still have it come to you tasting great. We've really corrupted our food supply chain like here in California. Salinas Valley, the so-called salad bowl of the US, more than 600,000 acres of fruit and vegetables. Every day, hundreds of trucks leave with tons of fresh produce. To arrive days later in cities all over the continent, like here on the East Coast near New York City. And then there's climate change, which makes problems even bigger. In California, it has been too dry for years. Salinas is drying out, a drought that is having a devastating effect. Dus er is geen water meer. Dus valt de productie terug. Dus zitten de andere staten naar lege schappen te kijken in de supermarkten. This is the situation Mike Zelkind wants to change. 
He wants fresh and healthy food to be grown close to the city. Our goal is to really change the way the world eats. Our goal is to bring back the food supply to the local communities, to the cities, to the areas where people reside, and make that food supply as good as it can possibly be. So that communities, cities, local areas can become self-sustainable again. Making cities self-sustainable again by restoring our connection to food. It's exactly what Dan Su does on his farm close to Beijing. Every year, up to 50,000 school kids visit his farm to see how the vegetables are grown. Dan Su started his farm because he realized how important it was for Beijing to have access to its own freshly produced food. Before we start this uh, program, there is one question bother me a lot is for a city like Beijing, there are 22 million people, but 90% of the food are imported, not imported, are coming from other provinces like Hebei, like Shandong, like Henan. Only 10% is from Beijing. So how can we ensure that the people will get enough fresh, high quality food? And they are, we are talking about 22 million people. Dan Su noticed that he had attracted the attention of the Beijing City Council, who realized how dangerous it is when a megacity is not self-sustainable when it comes to food. Actually, yesterday, uh, we had a conversation in this room with the government from the, from the city, the agriculture sector. And they came ask is this also to the mayor of the city, they want to know how can we do better for agriculture for Beijing? Because they realize if there's only 10% of food is from Beijing itself, it's, it's dangerous. It's not sustainable at all. Integrating food production in the city again. Dan Su was able to start his business with private money. But how can we make the city embrace its food production when land is expensive and scarce? Are cities interested in large-scale urban agriculture? Henry Gordon Smith, who helps large cities integrate agriculture solutions, is convinced they are. We're trying to work with cities around the world to do something called scenario analysis for local food systems. So we can take areas of the city and we can lay out our urban agriculture models and estimate scenarios for food security in that city. Plugging in greenhouses of different size, plugging in rooftop farms, plugging in basement community gardens. All these models I've been talking about, we have them in, in a data form and so we can lay them out. And, and cities need a data-driven approach for planning anyway. They use scenario analysis for planning roads. They use it for planning new developments. They just don't use it for agriculture yet. So we're trying to fit into their existing mechanism of planning and say, you know, this is, this is what the actual metrics are. Let's not talk about a green kind of vision. Let's talk about the yields. Let's talk about the jobs. Let's talk about the carbon footprint. Let's talk about the resiliency score of this system. So, you know, that's our vision as far as our work goes with cities and how we can encourage people to pursue the sustainable urban delta. But there is another factor that plays a crucial role. Worldwide, governments continue to subsidize their traditional industries, the fossil fuel and agricultural sectors, with astronomical amounts of money. Het idee alleen al dat, dat we met elkaar op een gesubsidieerde manier, waardoor brandstoffen uh, zo goedkoop zijn dat het rendabel is om soja uit Brazilië naar Europa te transporteren, om hier onze kippen en varkens en koeien mee te voeren, terwijl we ook nog subsidies geven in Europa om land braak te laten liggen, te vergroenen, onze landbouw. Terwijl natuurlijk met diezelfde subsidiestromen we zouden kunnen stimuleren dat je andere vormen van vever gewoon hier in Europa kan produceren. Dat is waanzin. We helpen voor 5300 miljard dollar per jaar de fossiele industrie aan betere winsten, terwijl dat echt funest is voor het klimaat op deze aarde en datzelfde klimaat ervoor zorgt dat onze eigen voedselproductie in gevaar komt 
Waardoor als wij op deze manier doorgaan, miljarden mensen honger hebben tegen 2050. Wie heeft dit bedacht? And the consequences of moving all this food around is that much of it is wasted. In the US, for instance, research shows that 40% of the food grown on US soil is lost. Kan je je voorstellen? Food is being wasted. But at the same time, there are still areas that don't have enough fresh food. In these food deserts, people have very little access to fruit and vegetables. Like here in Anacostia, a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Food deserts are a worldwide phenomenon. The poorer the neighborhood, the less access to fresh produce. Caffini, a local resident, takes us to the only supermarket in the area serving a community of 60,000 people. In the United States, there are cities where 25% of the population lives in food deserts. Their residents eat fast food most of the time. Daria Shakan is an internist in Camden, a town near Philadelphia. To her astonishment, she observes that people in Camden do not eat vegetables. They're not available. The physical consequences are obvious. You know, so in children, um, we see failure to thrive or malnutrition because a small child who eats a diet that is mostly simple carbohydrates isn't getting the protein they need to grow. So a lot of my small children are really underweight and struggle to gain weight. And then as they get a little older, once they get a little bit more protein, then they're eating foods that are packed with um, fats and simple sugars, and then they often become obese. And then my adult population, if you want me to go into that, I can, but you know, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, and actually increasingly in children, I'm seeing type 2 diabetes, elevated blood pressures, high cholesterol. We hebben op dit moment wordt er voldoende voedsel geproduceerd in de wereld om anderhalf keer het aantal mensen te voeden wat er op dit moment leeft op aarde. Dat betekent dat we genoeg voedsel hebben voor meer dan 10 miljard mensen. Dus het probleem is niet dat het voedsel er niet is. Het grote probleem is de ongelooflijke inefficiënte manier waarop dat voedsel wordt geproduceerd. En vervolgens wordt getransporteerd via vrachtwagens, schepen, vliegtuigen naar andere plekken in de wereld. Het grote probleem is de voedselverspilling. This can be changed if cities take the lead in stimulating local food production. Food is produced further away from consumers than ever before, grown in endless monoculture farms, which makes it difficult for farmers to survive. Like here in Western Australia. Ben Cole is an environmental engineer and farmer. He witnesses how this part of the world is deteriorating. Large-scale farming is, is really focused predominantly on monocultures. So it's, it's really about planting one crop um, and then replacing it with another crop the next year and doing that year on, year out. So an example might be wheat and then canola, wheat and then canola, wheat and then canola. Um, with that, you get real challenges around your soil fertility because you're using the same crops year in, year out. And of course, the pests, both in the soil, um, but above ground and the weeds, they get to really know uh, the chemicals that you're using. So it's really quite a, quite a sort of a spiral down. It's very high salinity encroaching, the overall global context of climate change. And financially, you know, farming isn't as viable as it used to be. Farmers need to buy their neighbor's farm and their neighbor's 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 farm. Effectively, the mantra is go to scale or leave, get out. This vicious circle can be stopped. Cities should take the lead in that process. This way, circularity would be one step closer. In Melbourne, Australia, Maney explains how megacities can be enablers for the circular economy. 
focus on the future means that it needs to be sustainable, it needs to be circular, it needs to be connected to the ones who are eating your food. Uh, and I think there is a very nice opportunity uh, if we think about uh, urbanized areas and how to integrate that green belt that normally was around the cities and we were pushing away uh, where it's not nice to live. Huh? So if we can integrate from, from the moment that we start thinking about it. Uh, you bring food production closer to the people. You can uh, reuse the water from the city for food production. You can balance your energy sources. You can uh, think about new business models. So I'm not only tomato producer, but I also deliver you the electricity. Or I'm not only the one who's making, producing the computers, but I use the wastewater from the city. Um, that is the first start of the circular economy. So my belief is more and more that when you implement this, so when you bring it close to where people live, uh, it is the most easy, most tangible way uh, of starting to create the circular economy that we so badly need. Inventiveness and creativity. Maney sees more and more inspiring business models around her as both technological possibilities and social awareness increase. In Sydney, Australia, Maney meets Johan Havinga and Sharon Markulin. These entrepreneurs devised a unique business concept, combining growing fish and vegetables. The actual key to their success remains a secret. <laughs> I can't tell you, it's in our IP. It's how we bring various elements together to create an organic process that allows us to use the waste of the barramundi to provide a fertilizer in growing organic plants. And how we do that is the magic between the start and the end. Creating smart relationships between growers and consumers. Gotham Greens in Brooklyn, New York, is the ultimate example. They built greenhouses on top of supermarkets, growing food close to where it's sold. We've really scaled over the past few years and now have, uh, we'll have almost 500,000 square feet of state-of-the-art urban greenhouse around the country. So it's been very rewarding to see the concept being proven from an idea into a, a sustainable commercial enterprise with hundreds of employees, and uh, a great vegetable brand that's now available in thousands of supermarkets across the United States. Bringing food production back to the city, it would have a great advantage and restore balance on many levels. It would make a difference all around the world for megacities on all continents, like Africa, where more and more food farmers are moving to the city. A lot of these people have been moving into urban areas because food production in this country is no longer commercially viable. They, 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 they're not just going to sit there and starve and die in those areas. They're going to move to where they believe they can make a living. And that's what is essentially happening at the moment. So if we want to, to, to stem it and we deal with these things, you've got great opportunities for, if you want, the green belts within the city We've got great opportunities for those who are still in the rural areas to produce the food that uh, we need. All around the world, cities continue to expand without including food production in their planning. But we also see citizens who are actively trying to make a change by initiating small but powerful projects. Yes. So, have you seen inside yet? No, not yet. It's still. No, please. It's still under construction a little bit, yeah. but it's coming along. Caffini, who we met in the food desert of Anacostia, shows us the small community farm that was started in her neighborhood. Like being able to provide food to the greater community. Providing the vegetables that are lacking in the supermarket. No, I'm sorry. I like some vegan dishes. I like a lot of vegan dishes because I don't like cheese. In Australia, we see a hopeful initiative of money moving in a different direction. Environmental engineer Ben Cole managed to find investors, allowing him to take his collective of organic farmers to the stock market. This photo was taken um, 6th of July, a uh, very happy day for me and Wide Open Agriculture when we formally listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. So I like to think it sort of sets a pathway for other companies, other young companies that are interested in listing, 
to say, oh, we don't have to only talk about money. Um, obviously, money is very important. Financial success is a very important measure of productivity. But what about all those other things that give us our social licence to operate, our impact on communities and farmland? Martin Gramco in California found a smart way to fight the local shortage of water. What you can see in this graph here, that all night long, this red line is showing very little water need. The plant is slowly drying out. This is the green line telling us how much water is, has, is available to the plant. And then it starts to wake up and you can see it start to use water. That's the red line. This is how much it's actually using. This approach allows Gramco to achieve the maximum yield. By purifying wastewater from the city and adding the necessary nutrients, he manages to water his plants in this dry area. You can see there we have two large tanks. Yeah. And then we have these four smaller tanks. We blend about 10 parts of the recycled water okay. to one part of groundwater. Wow. Into each one of these tanks. Each one has its own blending station. And while we're doing that, we're adding our organic feed. And then it stops. Local initiatives, large and small, are popping up in more and more cities. Detroit is a unique story, a beautiful initiative. We had 1.9 million people in 1951. It's the height of our population. And today we're at about 630,000. So we've lost two thirds of our population. If agriculture is going to be successful going into the future, uh, you need bodies to staff the greenhouses. So why not bring the growing to the bodies as opposed to the bodies to the growing? Detroit, once thousands worked in its 52 car factories. Now only two factories remain. But the city is not dead yet. Grassroots efforts are being made to shift from steel and rubber to soil and seeds. So we are where ground zero. So this is where our first greenhouse is going to go. Uh, it's going to cover two acres of land. It's going to go from the alley over there to the street that way. And it's going to go from the street behind me to the street that's on the other side of this building that's not torn down. Recovery Park aims at producing all kinds of vegetables for the neighborhood on a large scale. Gary has big ambitions. The tech of Greenhouse Future is being beta tested. This is a beta project for us. It's a test on growing leafy greens in a hydroponic pond. When we take this pond and we transfer the technology under a glass greenhouse and Mother Nature's bringing in free sun, our product will become very, very financially viable. Gary aims at using the workforce available in the neighborhood. Veterans, people recovering from addictions, and former prisoners are all welcome to apply at Recovery Park. My name is Tony Taylor. Um, I work for Recovery Park Farms as an associate. Um, I've been working here for a little over a year. Um, I came out of prison um, after 33 years, and Recovery Park was the first um, job offer that I had, you know, coming out of prison, you know, and, and, and they have been very, very supportive. Got the job, I got my own apartment, car, um, I'm about to get married, you know, so it's been pretty smooth and Recovery Park has helped that a lot because I'm here and I'm doing this work and I know that this is a place that, I, you know, I'm needed, you know, to see something begin to grow and then at the end you actually see the in product of something that you help produce is, yeah. is fulfilling. I call it an agri-hood. Uh, so it's a neighborhood all based on agriculture. Uh, almost all of it hydroponic, almost all of it uh, distributed to restaurants within a 300 mile radius around Detroit uh, and creating close to 300 jobs paying an average wage of $22 an hour plus benefits. I mean, that's good money. I didn't set out to change the world. Um, I'm not a hero. I'm not trying to be one. I just, uh, I'm just Gary, and I'm just, I'm just trying to, to give back. Investors should be encouraged to broaden their scope, to use valuable soil for different purposes, like food production. 
business models like these could solve many problems for expanding cities. If cities are starting to take the responsibilities and integrate their green belts into urbanized areas, that the real estate investors are becoming the growers of tomorrow, solving many social and environmental problems. And at the end, I believe because it's so close by to the first needs of people, it is also a nice way to start the circular economy and create this kind of new communities within those enormous metropolitan areas. Thank you very much. I think that you need people to spruik the future and to look at the present problems because most, most of us in the academic environment know it. We can see what's happening, but it's a matter of getting the message out clearly and articulately. It was so inspirational. Uh, it was challenging and thought-provoking, and uh, what I love most of all is the optimism, the optimism for the future. Mm -hmm. We're so used to the doomsday people who come along and say, well, this is going to change, it's the end of the world, and we're ruining this and we're ruining that. But as Marnie quite correctly pointed out, that there's so much opportunity there and we are an intelligent race and therefore we can solve problems. And that's what I took away from the, the talk today is that as long as we are smart and that we take incorporate it, we can take power and do things ourselves. You uh, look at all the problems in today's world, you look at how it's structured and how the problems keep repeating themselves, such as food production. So it's easy to get cynical and think that there's no change coming. And that was uh, the beauty of the talk today, is that Mani pointed out that I think we're going to see some disruptions across the globe, both due to technical and social changes. So that feeds you with a bit of optimism, thinking about that there will be disruptions, and let's make sure these disruptions contribute to the global economy and also to the global well-being. Washington, New York, Beijing, Sydney. All around the world, we see inspiring examples of initiatives that are creating sustainable urban deltas. Many hopes more and more cities will reconsider the integration of food production in order to create a more sustainable future for our megacities. And meanwhile, slowly but surely, pioneers around the world are creating a global movement. Waar zien we die voorbeelden waar dit gewoon aan het gebeuren is? Dat die steden wel die verantwoordelijkheid naar zich toe aan het trekken zijn. Dat ze ruimte aan het creëren zijn voor voedselproductie in de stad. Dat ze ondernemerschap helpen stimuleren. Dat je kan zien dat er nieuwe sociale coherentie ontstaat. Dat ook de arme wijken in de steden weer een nieuw perspectief krijgen... Om, omdat ze dit soort initiatieven mogen oppakken. Dat mensen mogen leren van elkaar. Dat de nieuwe... Uh, initiatieven ontstaan waarbij zelfs uh, wordt gekeken naar hoe kunnen we die circulaire economie rondom voedselproductie beginnen. Hoe kunnen we afvalwater uit de stad hergebruiken voor voedselproductie of, of kan ik tomaten telen maar ook energie leveren aan de woonwijk in de buurt. En de stad die beseft dat zij zelf voedsel zal moeten produceren voor de mensen in die stad op een duurzame manier.